<laughs> smiling face, aye. Are we on, on record now? Yes, we're recording, Chair. Recording. Right. Can I welcome all of you this evening to the Environmental Sustainability Student Committee held via the microscope team on Thursday, the 1st of October 2020 at 6.30 to consider the matters contained in the following agenda. Also, this meeting will be recorded and made available to, to view via the Council website, except for the discussions involving confidential or exempt items. Therefore, the image, audio of, these, of those individuals speaking will be publicly available to all via the recording on the Council website, www.cafili.gov.uk. Right, I now want to carry out a, a roll call, Rebecca. Yes, Chair. Rebecca? Yes, Chair, would you like me to call out the names, Chair? No, I'll call them out, it's all right. Right, Councillor Adams? Present, Chair. Councillor Collis is not present, but he's he's attended on the telephone. Yes. You, all right, thank you, Councillor. Myself, obviously. Councillor Ellsbury? Yes, I'm here, Chair. Councillor Evans? Present, Chair. Councillor Gale? Present. Councillor Gale? Present. Councillor Hussey? Present. Councillor Kent? Councillor Kent? You haven't got your, you haven't got your uh, microphone on? Yes, I'm here. Right, thank you. <sighs> Councillor Leonard, his apologies. Councillor Owen? Present. Councillor Priest? Present. Councillor Roberts? Present, Chair, am I? Thank you. Councillor Scrivens? Present. Councillor Whitcomb? Present, Chair. And Councillor Williams? Present, Chair. Thank you. Right. Now we've done a roll call. Uh, <coughs> well, my first, I'd like to welcome Councillor Owen onto the committee. Welcome, Councillor Owen. I can't see your space anywhere, but uh, Councillor Owen. Thank you, Chair. Okay. And I'm sure the members like to express their thanks to Councillor Simmons for the period of time he's been on this committee. All right, do you all agree? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Declaration of interest. Councillors and officers are reminded of their personal responsibility to declare any personal and or prejudicial interests in respect of any item of business on this agenda in accordance with the Local Government Act 2000, the Council Constitution and the Code of Conduct for both councillors and officers. Any declarations of interest? None at all? None, Chair. Thank you. Then I go to the item three, which is on page one to eight, the Environmental Sustainability Security Committee held on the 11th of February 2020. If I can go through the pages. For accuracy, page one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. If you can remember, the members who attended the meeting, someone move it through record or otherwise? I move right. that, Chair. Move that, second, second, that chair. The second, that chair. Second. Right. Right, Mark, we'll have to go through the vote now on that. Mark. That's right. That's that's right, Chair. So the, um, the, the poll will be on the uh, chat facility so show conversation if members click show conversation and um and, and then vote either for against or abstain and then click submit thank you mr chairman councillor owen 
Uh, I won't be voting or abstaining. Obviously, I wasn't at that meeting. Oh, quite right, Councillor Owen. Yes. Thank you. That's carried, Chair. There's a nine four, no zero against, zero abstentions, apart from uh, Councillor Owen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Right. We then go to the next item on item four, consideration of any matter referred to this committee in accordance with the calling procedure. There's none. Then we go to item five, which is the Environment and Sustainability Scrutiny Committee Forward Work Programme. Mark Jiggs, this is page nine to 22. Mark. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members are asked to consider the forward work program alongside the cabinet work program as appended to the report and to suggest uh, any changes. Um, I just bring your attention to the next meeting for the committee, which is on the 27th of October. As uh, members can see, uh, there's uh, two items in the forward work program for the 27th of October. Uh, we've got a decarbonisation strategy and action plan and the parking enforcement report. So that's coming later this month on the 27th of October. Uh, the reports. So um, if, if members are happy, I would like to seek approval to publish the uh, Environment and Sustainability Scrutiny Committee forward work programme as appended to the report um, with the uh, with the points that have just been raised as well. Um, and I'd like to uh, seek approval to have this uh, um, appended to the report and uh, uploaded to the um, to the council's website. Thank you, Chair. Anyone got any comments or questions or additions? If you want, I got it. You always pass them on to Mark and then he can record it. Someone, someone move you accept the report? I will move I that. accept it. Second it. Councillor Mike Adams. Right. Can we now go for the vote on that, Mark? Yes, Chair, that'll be in the um, chat function. So if members click show conversation. And it's item five, forward work program, for, against, abstain. And then if you could click submit vote at the end. Thank you. Mark, it's Alan, Councillor Alan Collis here. Do you want my yes. approval of the forward work yes. programme? Yes. For yes. or against or abstain? I, I should like to approve it. You you were for, are you? Y indeed, yes. Right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Collis. That's uh, with the verbal uh, vote from Councillor Collis. That's 11 for, zero against, zero abstentions. So that's carried. Thank you. OK. Right, we then go to item six, which is uh, receive and consider the following cabinet reports. Uh, we've uh, received none, so there's no, no uh, discussion on those. Then we go to item seven to receive the notice of motion, renew, renew decision on switch off of street lights. That's from page 23 to 28. We have three speakers to open up the proceedings on this item. We have Councillor Etheridge, Councillor Dix and Mrs. North, uh, Norris, please. Could Councillor Ed Edris please come to the table? Well, not the table, sorry. I think I'm still in a meeting. <laughs> could, I, could I first thank the, the Chair, Councillor Davis, for giving me the opportunity sure. to, to speak on this motion. I, I will be brief uh, as you were. Uh, all appreciate this will go to full council on the 6th of October. What well, you, um, do, you do realize you only speak towards the notice of motion in it in this full context? Yes, the um, the first point on the actual notice of motion uh, is, is regarding the historical uh, consultation that um, I oh, yeah, uh, 
uh, is of concern because the actual consultation is outdated. It was carried out in 2010, even though the, the report went to the scrutiny committee in 2018. Um, I believe that the historical information is out of date because there was only um, one uh, there was 1,448 responses. Um, and if you look at the actual um, population of, of the county borough, that was a very low response. So that's, that is the first uh, reason why I'm asking for a review of the policy. Um, and I'd like to stress only a review of the policy because of the outdated historical um, information. I believe that local communities and the public should be engaged with this review and there should be an up to date equality impact assessment. There should also be a risk assessment and safeguarding of issues for vulnerable people. Um, I previously sent an email in regarding the code of practice for street lighting, so I shan't go into that. Um, and finally, Chair, um, I believe that the voice of engagement with stakeholders and local communities in the county borough is of the utmost importance here. Um, and I would like to see, uh, in regard to consultation, a survey in, in the news line um, asking people what we need uh, in regard the the review and street lighting. And I believe that the voices of the people should be heard. And as I I'll, and I say finally, that's all the motion is asking for is a review of the policy and the procedure. And I would appreciate it if the committee would consider recommending a review to the full council. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Could uh, before you go, uh, Councillor Essex, could I just clarify a, a, a point that I'm concerned about? It's mentioned in there that we refer this to the meeting in 2018, in fact, on the 30th of October. And that was agended for the committee to consider. I'm a bit concerned, really, why you didn't you know, challenge it through a notice of motion or attend the meeting at that meeting. Any reason for that? Uh, and this, uh, this applies to the other signatories on the, on the notice of motion, as far as I'm concerned. I, fe I felt at that time, um, uh, Councillor Davis, we would we would give it a trial to see uh, how you know it uh, it actually have gone, and I thought you know we'd give it two years. But be the reason I put the notice of motion down is between uh, February and actually to date uh, in Blackwood Ward, we've had between fifty and seventy queries from the uh, residents. I don't, I, I don't want to go on that. I, all I'm Ask the question because I thought it more appropriate at that yeah. time. If you had any objections, right, that you could have been raised at that meeting. Yeah. All right, you've clarified the situation. Okay. Okay. Thank you, then. Thank you, uh, Councillor Sridge. Right, the next speaker on this now is Councillor Dix. Councillor Dix, please. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. Um, uh, yeah, you have five minutes, uh, as you know, Councillor Dix. OK, thanks, Chair. The reason why I didn't bring it up before was the same as Councillor Everidge. You know, it's a new policy. Nobody knows how they're going to play out these policies until you give them a bit of a, a, bit, a bit of space and time. You know, policies are made in one day and then years later we look back and obviously we uh, have the opportunity to review them. So I thought this would be a, a good opportunity two years into it to uh, speak at this meeting today and give you my experience of what's happening. Um, as you know, the policy was originally approved by the committee uh, 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 chair and the reasons that I put, uh, put forward with the council I if I remember at the time was that they were looking at uh, saving nine hundred thousand pounds. Councillor Dix you must stick to the notice of motion in this context you can't wait you can't go off that I'm sorry. Okay okay well the notice of motion is asking for the review um, and I strongly support this notice of motion in the light that it's two years into the uh, the switch off at 12 o'clock. Um, and I think it's a good time now to review it and the effects it's had on the community, uh, in particular my community, with lots of people feeling unsafe. So, in, no, sorry, Councillor Stop me again, that's it. can't yeah, wander off into that. Stick to the notice of the motion, please. That's standing orders. I, that's not me, that's standing orders. Okay. 
OK, I support the notice of motion and that there is a proper and full review and the review takes into account uh, uh, the effects that it's had on residents throughout the Caffili County Borough, i.e. their safety, their, their property, the safety of their property and the safety of their uh, personal being in regard to the switch off. OK, right. Is Thank that, you. Thank you, Councillor Niger and Dix. Thank nice you. to see you. And you, Tudor. Right. Now we have Mrs Norris. Welcome, Mrs Norris. Um, hopefully that you can see me there. The first thing I'd like to do is to I thank can't you see you yet. Oh yes, I, oh, right. Yeah. I can see okay. Mrs Norris, you have five minutes, all right? Okay, thank and you. As you're a lady and uh, a resident, I might give you an extra few minutes if you... Uh... Right. Thank you, then. Um, I'd like to say thank you to this committee for enabling me to come and, and to give my views as a resident within the county borough. I reiterate the first point that Councillor Etheridge made about the, the low rate of consultation. Um, He's already explained that there were only 1,448 responses out of a county borough population at the time of the consultation of 173,124. But actually, by the time that the, both reports um, went forward in 2018 on street lighting, the response, uh, the population had actually increased. And so the response rate to the consultation was 0.79%. So this means the decision to turn off street lights between midnight and 5.30 a.m. has been based on less than 1% of communities' views. My second point on the consultation is that in the 2018 reports to scrutiny and cabinet, it was noted that further consultation may be needed prior to implementation of the decision. But this hasn't been done. And of added concern, even though there's a public service board, a safeguarding partnership, a community safety partnership, a partnership scrutiny committee and a social service scrutiny committee, all of which have an interest in decisions affecting communities. It doesn't seem that these were directly consulted at the time. My third point is that some workers have no choice but to travel through what are now blacked out communities after midnight, including some of the more risky areas in the county borough. For instance, emergency staff, um, NHS workers, fire, police, ambulance staff, but also taxi drivers, social workers, hospitality workers and shift workers. Arguably, questions should have been set to tar specifically target these workers' views in the consultation that was completed. So maybe a reasonable question here is whether the council feels any responsibility for the risks that these people face in carrying out their everyday jobs because of the decision to remove uh, street lighting between midnight and 5.30 a.m. My last point on the, on the consultation is that the Wales Audit Office carried out a study in 2017 into Caffili's scrutiny function. And during this, they wrote that councils performing well on consultation showed a number of key characteristics. For instance, and I quote, enabling the voice of local people and communities in decision and policy making decisions, uh, processes, sorry, end quote. Given the shortcomings pointed out on the consultation, it's pertinent to question whether this scrutiny committee feels confident that this characteristic has been carried out. Now I'll pick up on the second point of the motion about the decision having been based on outdated studies. I make my first comment on the equalities impact assessment that was appended to the reports on reducing street lighting. This assessment is necessary to gauge the impact of any uh, report proposals and ultimate council decisions on certain groups of people in communities. The law calls them protected categories. The assessment that was completed for the street light uh, reductions report linked to a study aimed to show there would be no detrimental impact on communities if street lighting was reduced. But as with the consultation, this study was many years out of date by the time the reports were presented. My second point is about the lack of balance that was given on the findings from the study that was linked. 
The study drew on data from only 62 out of 174 local authorities across England and Wales. But even this figure is speculative because according to Wikipedia, there are 343 local authorities across England alone. And so adding the 22 Welsh authorities, as we know, this study arguably has been based on only 62 out of 365 authorities which is unlikely to give reliable data to support any decision. Thirdly, and very concerningly, it looks like the findings from the study may have been used selectively to promote support for streetlight turn-off, because there were a number of findings in the study that didn't support the proposal, and these haven't been used. I'll just give you one example, and I'll quote. It is possible that local authorities may have declined to participate to, study, to the study because of expected or known increases in collisions or crime in their areas due to lighting changes. If changes in collisions or crime are greater in the non-participating authorities, our study may have underestimated the effects of reduced lighting on collisions and crime." Unquote. My last point on this is about the same, is, is, uh, that around the same time that this study was published, there was also a report on streetlight reductions prepared for DEFRA. And I'll give you a quote from this. Public road lighting serves important roles in assisting traffic safety and aiding crime prevention. Therefore, any changes to the way public road lighting services are delivered require, require careful consideration and management. Now I'll turn to, the, um, to point three of the motion about a lack of robust assessment of protected categories of groups in communities and the so equality. Morris, I give you seven minutes, I'll give you another one minute, all right? Okay, thank you. My point here is that the assessment's been completed with subjective statements about older, older age groups and the visually impaired, but no evidence has been given. Secondly, the assessment looks to have been written to actively promote the case for reducing carbon emissions and for protecting bats, but this isn't relevant or appropriate in the assessment. I'd like to say something about um, how this decision, in my view, has undermined um, other key council policies. There are partnerships, as I've pointed out, and statutory groups that the Council supports wholeheartedly, that looks after people in terms of safeguarding, um, addressing domestic abuse and addressing poverty. And there are a, a large number of partnerships that the Council engages in that looks after this, and yet none of these decisions have been passed by these groups. And I am quite sure that people who are in poverty situations will find it even more difficult as a result of possibly having to afford security systems and increase insurance premiums because of this decision. Sorry, um, Mrs Norris, I've given you now eight minutes, so have you got just one last comment to make? Um, I think it's just the fact that this has undermined, it, undermined a lot of key council policies. And that isn't only a shame, but it's absolutely, and um, it's not just unfortunate, but it's it's really not in the favour of communities. And I really do feel that the decision needs to be considered. Thank you, Mrs Norris. Thank you for coming along. Appreciate that. Okay, thank you. It's all right, thank you very much. Right then, uh, we now got two officers who are dealing with this tonight, this evening. Is Marcus Lloyd and uh, Tom Llewellyn, these are the officers. Marcus. Good evening, Chair. Thank you. Um, if I could pick up on some of the points raised and uh, the report. Obviously, um, it's highlighted by the um, speakers tonight that it's public concern. Um, I think I would challenge that. I know the report states that there was 227 complaints. But when you look at the, the complaints and you break those down, 74 of them were regarding the LEDs being too bright, so had nothing to do with hard light lighting. 57 were regarding there's no more overspill of light, which was um, provided previously because of the LEDs. So you can discount those. So there's only 96 
that are in relation to the part night lighting. So when you consider those even further, they could be taken from either social media or informally brought into the council and they've all had answers. Once they've had an answer, they do have an opportunity then to challenge that answer and move it on to a formal stage one complaint. Only two of the complaint of these have moved on to a formal stage one complaint. They've had answers and neither of those took them on to a stage two complaint. I think we can't lose sight of the fact that the main driver for this is the carbon reduction. We've de now declared a climate emergency. There were climate concerns at that time. This initiative provides 2,800 tonnes worth of carbon savings. We have to take that on board. I think everyone's seen all of the more recent television programmes highlighting the concerns for the environment and for the climate, particularly with the change in weather patterns, increases in um, heat, increases in flooding. Um, we've got Storm Alex on the way this weekend, and these are all down to climate change. So we as a council have to make our contribution to try and tackle this. Um, I know members have suggested that it's a trial, but obviously if, it, if it's a trial, that should have been brought up at the start that we would, they wanted it looked at as a trial. This was an initiative. There's been a significant investment into this. We are well, well advanced with this initiative. We will be complete at Christmas time. So at the moment, we have completed 69% of the part night lighting and 80% of the LED conversions. Safety of property um, is something that obviously householders have to take into account themselves. Street lighting is provided um, as from a legislative point of view, we don't have to provide it, but where it is provided, it is for the safe passage of pedestrians and vehicles on the highway. It is not to protect property. So we could discount that. With regards to EIAs, EIAs have been undertaken as, as have risk assessments. I think the approach we've taken is robust. Um, we are monitoring any effects. The crime statistics from uh, Gwent Police that we've got do not indicate any increase in crime. I've had meetings with the police and they say it's perception. They are not aware of any significant increase in crime. We also received data with regard to traffic collisions. There is nothing that gives us any concern at the moment. We're waiting the official data that needs to be verified by Welsh Government for 2019, but we get regular updates from them if there are any serious accidents on, or incidents on the network, and there's nothing untoward in what we're seeing. So as from what I can see, there is no real reason at all to change the way that we are operating and the policy that's in place. Thank you, Chair. Mr. So Llewellyn, does he want to does he want to make any comments? Uh, no, no, Chair. Uh, I'm just backing up uh, Marcus on uh, on everything he stated so far. Thank you, thank you, Tom. Okay. Right, I've had uh, the first person who wants to speak is Councillor Whitcomb. Councillor Whitcomb. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wish not to recommend uh, this notice and motion to Council, and I wish the Scrutiny Committee to not in, in endorse the notice and motion. Um, I do so for a, a number of reasons, and I did intend to ask um, the officers a, a number of um, questions, but thank you, uh, Mr Lloyd, you've perfectly answered everything I was going to ask anyway in a very clear and concise manner. I mean, one of the reasons uh, I, I can't support the motion it was alluded to by the, by the chairman himself. Uh, the initiative was brought before this committee in 2018 and then full council. Uh, it has been brought up in council a number of times and indeed uh, on one occasion the leader of the opposition presented a, a petition to council on the subject and it must be noted when he was a member of the cabinet that he uh, supported part-time lighting and a reduction in the number of hours of operation. Uh, as Mr Lloyd has pointed out we are very well, much on the way to completing this uh, initiative uh, an initiative completed by Christmas and to introduce a change of strategy at this stage and there's been ample time in the past to raise concerns and request reviews 
is unwise and unwarranted. I'm, I'm also quite puzzled. I know Councillor Etheridge can't answer me uh, via the, uh, the committee meeting, but why he raised a number of questions with a, a, a cabinet member, Councillor Ridgewell, when the appropriate forum to do so would, would be within this committee uh, via officers. Uh, and obviously, I, I presume that Councillor, Councillor Owen will, will ask him for the detailed questions as he goes through. Um, therefore, um, I cannot recommend uh, this uh, notice of motion and I seek support to, do, to reject it. Thank you, Chair. Are you, moving, are you moving a motion, Councillor Whitcomb? I, I am moving a motion that we reject this notice of motion, Chair. Is that seconded? I'll second that, uh, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Whitcomb. Councillor Mark Evans. Thank you, Chair. Um, the question is to Marcus Lloyd. It's about engagement. It is. Um, how does the engagement around that report compare to other times that we've gone out to consultation? Just, just what a rough idea. Hi, Councillor Evans. Um, I, I couldn't tell you, but uh, generally, um, for any sort of consultation, figures are low. Um, this was particularly low, which again, to my mind, given the amount of publicity that was put out around this and the fact that when we did the initial consultation, it went out in Newsline and there was a lot of publicity around it um, at that point in time, that we got very little response. So residents couldn't be particularly concerned. And similarly, now we've moved on. Um, based on the number of complaints I've said, only 96 complaints for the population that we've got relating to Park Night Light in, since we've implement, started implementation this back in early 2019, we're now probably almost 18 months into this now, um, that shows that there's not that much public concern out there with regard to it. Okay, thank you, Chair. Sorry, uh, Mrs Norris, you're not able to answer ask any questions. Councillor Owen. So, sorry, Chair, can I just, before Council, maybe help with um, Councillor Mark Evans's um, question in terms of how it compares to other consultation. Apologies to, to, to interject. Um, Councillor Evans, just to, to, to illustrate uh, a, a similar process, we consulted, you will probably all recall, on our sport and active recreation strategy. Um, again, back in, uh, the report was considered by scrutiny in, in two th late 2018. Um, that was a quite, quite a significant consultation exercise online, social media, uh, some face-to-face -face, uh, sessions, and we had 700, I think it was 770 responses from, a, again, from a population of 180,000. So, you know, the, the, the responses to the consultation on street lighting are not abnormal. The, the, in fact, the level is quite good when compared to the sport and active recreation consultation. Thank you, Chair. Apologies for interjecting. It's all right. Right, Councillor Owen. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to make a few comments. I have got a comment for a uh, question, actually, for Marcus. Um, firstly, all along, and we were told in Council by a Cabinet member that the um, there's no statutory requirement, which is right if you're not putting street lighting on a street that is already not lit. But if you've got street lighting, uh, which we have, and we've now changed it, but our street lighting is out there, uh, and it's out there to a standard, a British standard. So within that standard, is there's a lot there's a lot of information um, as to. How, how the street lighting um, system is. And one of the things is it's not a primary function of the lighting uh, to provide guidance for traffic. It's actually more for safety and for, for pedestrian safety. Now, although we're talking about safety of houses, et cetera, and people are saying, you know, because it's dark, that is one thing, of course. And yes, you can put cameras on your house and, and do whatever you need. but. You've got to get to and from your houses safely and that is what the lighting actually gives you it gives you a sort of safety and security so getting back and forth now that's 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 the one thing so um the other thing is then is uh is to do with 
crime prevention and detection. And again, um, it's rec it, what it says about crime prevention and detection is that if in areas which are of an high crime risk, and clearly we would have that within the borough, I'm not going to name places or whatever because I'm not uh, privy to exactly what those uh, the, the various places would be. But we, we certainly have got places uh, where there would be an high crime risk. And what it says to that is that it says if there is an area of high crime risk, it is recommended in such areas that the lighting levels are not reduced at any time of the night, clearly because of the, the, the risk. So we've got a lighting system. Um, I'm totally in agreement with the fact that we switch off our lights on the trunk roads between our towns and whatever. And then we come into the towns and we've then decided um, to basically to reduce the light in. And again, we've decided on part night light in. Um, the other option is complete switch off apart from uh, stuff such as dimming. But again, with respect to part night or switch off, when you make a decision to do that, at that time, and it may be two years now, but at that time, if you decide on one of those two options, you must implement a full risk analysis and user consultation has got to be undertaken. Now, that is to satisfy the standard. So that's my first question now to, um, to Marcus Lloyd is... I know we talked in, uh, about the historical consultation and the numbers, but did we actually take out, uh, I, I've never seen it, I've read the reports back from 2018, and Marcus knows that I went on to him uh, about this in the very beginning of this year, about other options. But clearly, I've not seen a full risk analysis to bring this in, uh, or a user consultation, which would have had to have been done prior to actually implementing it so that's my first question to marcus and the well, second you, question to marcus then to follow that is obviously we've gone for the part night lighting but there is uh, there is another option which is dimming which is uh we we haven't said a lot about that in these reports either but if we had gone down the dimming route we could dim the light in across the old borough and save at least the same amount, if not more, I would guarantee more personally, by dimming the light in than actually switching them off at night. So what we would do is we'd put twi twilight lighting on in our side streets, which would give us that security and safety net. And then we would switch down our other light in as well, based on traffic figures, and we would have actually saved. Well, I, I, I could prove with 100% that we would save more money than we actually save in. So the two questions are, is about the risk analysis, user consultation prior to the implementation, not in 2010, in 2018. And then secondly, how much um, investigation did we do into dimming? Because dimming is actually, uh, could have saved us more money. Thank you. Marcus. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Owen, for the questions. Um, no with regard to risk analysis, the risk analysis have been undertaken and they can be provided um, as and when. Uh, with regards to the consultation, the initial cons there's no time frame on that consultation uh, because the consultation at the time we took, undertook in 2010 was for this option. So that is what has been used. And we've also undertaken then an equalities impact assessment with regard to it as well and looked at that. Um, as part of the, the risk analysis has been undertaken. The risk analysis is per area. We've got 28 areas within, within the borough and each risk analysis has been undertaken for each of those areas. Um, with regard to the pedestrian safety, and the, uh, uh, that's why we've looked at uh, one of the things that's come out of the risk analysis is obviously some of the, the, the timings and because obviously midnight to 5.30 is when there's minimal people about that is the, the most appropriate time to do it because there aren't many people walking about at that time of night. 
Um, with regard to the crime prevention that's mentioned, obviously high risk areas, totally agree with you. That is uh, something that where we obviously we've got cameras already within the borough in some of those areas. Lighting has been left on in those areas. Similarly, for the within the pedestrian areas where we've got traffic calming, lights have been left on in those areas where there are significant concerns. So all junctions, the main town centres are left on. The areas where we've got issues, where we've got cameras, um, which we work with uh, the various partners with regard to that to make sure that we can ensure safety and they can see what's going on because the lights are still there. Um, and with regard to the, the dimming, um, I think that's a conversation we need to have because our figures do not stack up one bit for dimming. There is no payback on dimming compared to park night lighting. It actually will cost us money. Carbon will increase, which is one of the big things, because you won't get the carbon savings that you have because the LEDs that we've implemented are so low in power output that you won't get the, the amount that you would hope for. Um, and we've done the figures based on a 50% dimming, and it's basically going to cost us more money if we won't achieve a saving compared to the park light like then. Right, Councillor Scrivens, please. Councillor Scrivens. Hello, uh, Mr Chairman. Am I not allowed to come back, am I? No, or? no. You've spoken once on the other item. Councillor Scrivens. OK, Chair. Right, the first one is a comment. That's regarding the uh, number of complaints. I know Mark has said it's relatively low. Um, I think that's due down to uh, the public. Don't like to pick up the phone or put pen to paper. But um, I think if you're out there knocking doors, I think uh, the answer would be nine, 9 out of 10 ain't happy with the, the lights. Uh, so that's the comment on that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing then is the uh, the carbon footprint um, going on about that. Um, I noticed now for the better we're putting out all these uh, electric uh, charging bays. I was just wondering what kind of uh, carbon footprint they're having on the better. And then the next one is regarding the stats. Uh, wondering whether we could have stats for certain wards. I know the police are reporting this pretty even throughout, but uh, wondering if we could have stats to see if certain wards are getting hit harder than others. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. Councillor Adams. Chair, did you want me to respond on that? Oh, OK. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, with, the car with regard to the carbon footprint, obviously, this is a balance there, obviously, with putting the charges in. There's obviously some electric from that, but obviously they, it looks you're using electric cars as well. So there's a, there's a big saving in what they're outputting as well, and the air quality and the nitrogen, nitrogen dioxide and all of those elements that need to come into it. And with regard to the stats, we're working closely with the police. At the moment, they're giving us stats for uh, two of the areas, the Lower Rumley Valley and Lower Lisloin, um, for the last quarter of 2019, which shows no discernible change from the, the previous year. Um, obviously, they need some time to, to collate that data and get it through to us after, this, after the, the park night line has been implemented. But it is something we're working closely on with them. Right, well, now Councillor Adams, Mike. Thank you very much, Chair. It's been a good uh, interesting debate uh, so far, good questions. But what we need to remember is that at next week's council, where this is going to be forwarded to perhaps, this may well appear in our literature already forwarded twice, because it's there in the minutes from the council meeting of the 3rd of March. It's page 22, it's item 8, and the question asked then was very so similar to this one tonight, the answer is going to be pretty much the same for all to see. Now, it's not a policy, Kevin, from one day of evidence and then put in place. It started years before when around when adopted between settlements. And now during all of that time, available evidence of variable light levels form part of officer investigation, as Marcus has said and was not deemed adequate for such a large area and the number of lamps. 
Now, we talk about the number of people complaining or just getting in touch. I've had three phone calls in four years, unfortunately. One was because the new LED light wasn't placed by somebody's gate and didn't light up their path to their front door. Most other people around that uh, property actually had their own security lighting, which came on. I've had two others in Pond and Frith, and both were able to say, well, we don't think it's right, but there was no evidence provided to say there'd been any problems because of it. So I think I, all I can do tonight is support Councillor Whitcomb and suggest this doesn't actually need to go to Council. The decisions have been made with all the correct evidence and not the perception and, I must say this, scaremongering from other members in different areas. Thank you all. Well, you're just making a statement there. Councillor Gale. Well, I, I could ask the question, but I well, don't you, think it's needed. All right. But you haven't asked the question, so I'm not asking the officers to respond to it. Councillor Gale, June. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, what I'm concerned about is uh, the cost savings that we may make from street lighting is going off for two hours during the early hours. Um, and I, I also thought that um, people who got uh, their own outside lights, if everybody put them on, at least there'd be more lighting during the night, which I do every night. I put my light on outside light. So what are the cost savings uh, for putting the lights off during the early hours? Thank you, Chair. The, the cost savings of the, this initiative for the LEDs and the park night lighting was around £940,000. Uh, but there's a significant carbon saving as well, which is the, the big thing, particularly in the, the current environment um, that we're in with regard to climate change of 2,810, as I mentioned earlier. Yes. Right, thank you for that, Chair. All right. Uh, Councillor Kent, Steve. Sorry about that, I had a bit of a child emergency then. I had to run off, I had a daddy shout. Um, yeah, my question, uh, I, first of all, this question is, is when I went back, when we were going back in the, when we first through the period of austerity, um, switching off street lights was primarily seen as an economic saving from the regeneration budget, if I'm not, if I'm, unless I'm mistaken. But I think it would be remiss of us as a council to discount having a periodic review of something of this magnitude that affects so many people and just dismissing it out of hand is not needed. Because like John uh, Councilor Scriven said, on the door and wherever you see people, if they can show from two metres now, that you do get people saying, oh, I wish the streetlights would come back or I wish they'd be back on on a very, you know, very low a very low scale. It's just some ambient lighting. Because some people are shift workers, they get home at midnight, carers, nurses, doctors, they work, they, people do come home in the dark and they've got no option to have a say in this matter. I know that we very rarely get consultation responses in the thousands. That's happened for everything. But I do, I do, a, I can't support Andrew, uh, Councillor Whitcomb on this because I do think we need a periodic review of things of this magnitude. Thank you. Any, any response, Marcus, you want to make on that? Only one thing, Chair. Um, obviously, any review will be uh, impact on the amount of carbon saving that we're making. And obviously, there is a significant financial contribution that would have to be made then to change anything that we've done. And as I mentioned earlier, we've, we've practically finished this investment now of four and a half million pounds worth of investment. So to go back and start changing this, the money's going to have to be found from somewhere and we also wouldn't achieve the carbon savings that we've already uh, on roads to achieve. Councillor Essie. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I was going to ask uh, quite a few questions, but most of them have been answered. Um, I'd like Mr. Lloyd to, um, if he could, tell us how much it would cost to convert um, it back to uh, the units that have already been done. And um, if we did agree to uh, go back to it, how long it would take to convert it back? Uh, if we were to remove the nodes um, from the uh, streetlight, then uh, the, sorry, the um, the photo cells, and put it back, we would. It probably cost us in, in the order of three hundred thousand pound, and it'll probably take about a, a year to do. Um, but obviously, there's the part night light then contributes over seven hundred ton of carbon emissions with those savings. So if we did. We'll also drop our carbon savings by 700 ton, which is not very good for the climate. Thank you, Mr. Lloyd. That was uh, another one of the questions I was going to ask about. Um... So, sorry, one other thing, Councillor Hesse, that I, there would be additional, it, it cost us obviously £300,000 to implement that. There would be the additional energy costs on top of that then that we would have to be paying as well. And that would be significant. Again, that would be in the order of another three hundred thousand pound a year that we would have to pay on top of what we pay in. So it'd be three thousand three hundred thousand to convert it, and another three hundred thousand pound a year in additional energy costs that would be ongoing. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lloyd. Thank you, Chair. Well, there's no other one of us to or put the hands up for to ask any questions. Can I ask uh, Marcus? <coughs> Sorry, I got a bit of a cold today. Can I ask yeah. Marcus what the total consequences of this? Now, my understanding that the report is outdated on the um, percentage. Sorry, Councillor Owen, you've already you've already spoken. Please put your hand down. Yeah, Marcus. Yeah, there's a few uh, with their hands up. Well, June, I, am got any, I am going to any more, yeah. I am going to new ones. Oh, June Gale, she's had her hand up for quite a while. Oh, yes, yeah, she's on here, yes. I, she's moved so, up the top there. Yeah. Sorry, Jen. Anne. Sorry, Anne. It's sorry, moving up and down. It's, that's the trouble, and it's overtaking each other. Yeah. Sorry, Anne, yes. Come on, Anne. Thank you. I just wanted to ask Marcus about the, the publicised timings for the lights going off at half past um, uh, midnight to half past five. But in um, in my ward, in areas such as Clydewen and Getley Gare, they're not going off until 20 to one and they're not coming on until after six o'clock, which obviously there are a number of people who do go to work from half past five to six o'clock. And we have one lady that does um, leave the house after half past five. So I wonder if you could uh, address that. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Councillor Gay. There, there are um, timing um, variances because of the way that the photo cells align themselves to the moon. <laughs> I know it's, uh, it's strange, I, I, but I'll leave the technical detail to this one to Tom Flewellyn to, to fill you in because he, he's more fair with this than, than myself. Tom, could you provide the answer, please? Yes. I have, I yeah. have actually had a, a, a response, or, or my colleague has had a response, but it's a very complex response to try and um, pass back on to the residents. And obviously, yeah. it doesn't solve the issue. In Lehman's terms, the um, the photo cells they, they just they work just by if it's light they'll switch off and it's dark they'll come on, but they've got uh, an internal electronic mechanism and they they work out their own time ends for and set the midnight point, you know they do that they consider the length of the period of darkness from the night before and they use that for their switch off point, which is as close to midnight as as that the electronics can achieve. So once they switch off, then they, they switch off for five and a half hours and switch back on. So it's it's not a an exact timing, but it's the it's the best that that type of technology can can do at this moment. Um, we have got lights out there as well. That's on the central management system, and they switch off bang on twelve o'clock and back on at five thirty. That's computer control. That is okay. So we could have those in our area. Um, is this 
significant yeah. investment, as, as I mentioned to Councillor Owen on that, um, and it doesn't achieve any sort of payback. The, the ones we've got in um, at the moment on the central management system, we're part of new developments, and the deve we had the developer pay for them as a trial to see how they went. But the, the amount of investment required, it just doesn't stack up at all. Um, and what Tom didn't um, add was that timing continually re reassesses itself. So as the hours of darkness change, it re readjusts itself and try and bring itself back in line to, to the midnight point. So you you should it shouldn't it shouldn't always be twenty to to, to mid uh, twenty to, to one in the morning till uh, six thirty. It, it should try and adjust itself to to the right timings. And it's most noticeable at this point in the year, just prior to the, the, the actual clock changes, and you'll see it certainly in the week after the clock changes, you know, while these uh, timings are re-established, but they do, they will settle down and they will revert to being closer to midnight and 5.30, as we expect. Okay, thank you. Anyone else now? Sorry, Councillor uh, Morgan, you can come in later on. No one else? Okay, yeah, Mark Williams, Alexander, for a while. No, as well. no, I don't want officers at the moment. I want any members. Any more members who haven't spoken? Can I just interject, Chair? Um, there's a lot of members with their hands raised. Can we just ask members who've already asked the a question to, 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 yes. to, to lower their hands? So once you've asked a question, could you please lower your hand? Because we've got lots of hands raised and the questions have been asked. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. There's no more. Councillor Owen, if you can just... Can I say something? Well, Tom, yes, but you're not down on the list on you. But I, you can't... I did put my... Uh, put it, my uh, Wait, it doesn't come up. Come on then, Tom, yes, you speak. can speak on it. Right, can I... Let's, let's go... When you go back a, a few years ago, what we did in... And Marcus uh, know, know all about this. We reduced... The, the yellow lighting to you can say white lighting. A lot of people didn't like it because it uh, the the yellow lighting was so was so good. But since then, and I I explained to people why we did it was to save money and not and the uh, and everything else that goes with that. And ever since then, they've accepted it because we we reduced. The size of the of the street lighting, and and we and that's a decision that we took, and I don't understand why we wanted even shut lighting off, because as has been said, the lights coming on are protecting people, and that's what we are here for, is to protect our communities, right throughout. So I'd like to support uh, Andy. Right, I've got one here from Colin Ellsbury. Colin? Uh, no, Chair, I am, I'm not aware oh, I got, of that. I got your name on it, okay. Sorry, Anyone I'm not else? aware of that. Okay, thank you, Colin. Anyone else? Right, Councillor Owen, I'll give you um, another one chance. Councillor Owen? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for letting me come back. And it was only in uh, response just, to just a short one. No. Uh, yeah, it, I'm, I'm not going. Yeah, I've, it was in response to Marcus uh, on about the, uh, the the risk assessments and the dimming and whatever. Um, and obviously, we just talked about the um, the CMS system. So, a question to Marcus with reference to what is on the CMS system. And obviously, I'd like to talk more detail to him, which I can do outside of this meeting. But can we dim? Is the CMS system ones, uh, uh, you know, dimmable? I know we're talking about the other ones that we're just talking in Anne's area, but on the CMS system, are they are they dimmable? Thank you. The, the easy answer to that, Councillor Owen, is, is yes, and we are dimming them. So yes, that 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 is there, and we are using it. All right, Bob. Right, you have the answer. Okay, I'll uh, I'll speak Anyone to Marcus else? outside. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, Jenny, well, can, can I just come back with a comment on Councillor Gale's comment? No, no, sorry. You know, I mean, all right, go on. Come on, John. Yes, a short one, please. Thank you. Just, just um, as Councillor Gale suggested, if uh, all the residents started putting light and outside their houses, um, yeah, that would be great in one way, but it's, it's going to be defeating the object of it's going to be more carbon than if the council just turned the lights turn back on. Okay, John, thank you. Right, uh, Marcus, could you respond to uh, the question of the percentage of the lights that's now been completed? Because the report is indicating the 63%. We had a meeting yesterday, as you know, late in the afternoon. Can you now give the updated uh, information of the yes, percentage? Yes, the part night lighting is 69% complete now, and the LED uh, conversion is 80% complete, and everything is on track to be complete um, before the end of December. We had a slight delay with the, the part night lighting nodes being delivered due to the COVID situation, um, but they're now in stock, and we're well back on with it. So from the figure you had at the end of July, which was 14,200, is now up to 15,090, is that correct? An increase of 1,200 since the July it's, one. Uh, up to 15,891 units now, I think. No, sorry, no, hang on, sorry. I'm going on the figures you gave me yesterday. Oh, wow. Yes, you are correct, Chair, apologies. Okay. Can I also mention that uh, I asked the other question, how many wards have been, the wards have actually been either completed or in the, in the, they are going to be completed. And of the 30 uh, wards, up until the end of September, 25 of those 30 have either been finished or in the, uh, or will be finished which is 84% of the wards. And there's only five wards left now before the end of the year, which you were indicated will be finished. And two of those will be done in October, two in November and one December. Is that correct, correct information? Yes, Chair, that is correct. So, so the point I'm getting to is the extent already of what the programme has done. And I think members got to consider that fact of reversing it and already indicated the financial cost of it and uh, you know the other problems that come along with it. Am I right there, Marcus? You are, you are correct, Chair. We've already spent 3.7 million. That's right. And the financial aspects, where are you going to find that money? That's the question at the end of the day. Am I, am I correct? You are correct again, Chair. Thank you very much. Right. Mark? Mark Williams, you wanted to come in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just just a brief point. I just wanted to, 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 to make sure the committee are absolutely clear on our legal powers in relating to street lighting. So it's the, it's the section of the of the Highway Act, Highways Act 1980, uh, provision of uh, lighting, lighting of highways, which actually says a highway authority may, may provide lighting for the purposes of any highway or proposed highway for which they are or will be the highway authority and may for that purpose to contract or construct etc the important point councillor owen suggested that once lights are in place there is a legal duty to keep them that is not the case because the, the second subsection of section 97 of the highways act says highway authority may alter or remove any works constructed by them under this section i.e lighting works or vested in them so and a highway authority can choose to remove light in um, and it doesn't doesn't need to replace it. And also th there is a significant amount of case law relating to street lighting. So there's a particularly interesting case called Heath McCabe versus Cheshire West Council, which was heard by Judge Halbert back in 2014, where Cheshire West Council had failed to replace a light that had gone out on some steps and a gentleman fell and injured himself. Um, and tried to claim that the council should have uh, repaired or replaced the light to light the steps, and he lost that case. And it's you know it, it, so that, so there is a lot of case law on this. So there is no duty on a local authority legally to provide street lighting, or where it does provide street lighting, 
to keep that lighting in place. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Right, uh, Councillor Whitcomb, you were the mover of the motion. Do you wish to close the, the debate? Uh, yes, I do, uh, Chair. I, I, I consider we've had a good debate on it and some good answers, um, and I, I would like to close the debate. Thank you, Chair. Could you repeat the, the motion that you moved? The motion that I moved was to um, not to recommend the notice of motion submitted to the council uh, and not to submit it to council, therefore. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mark, Jake. Yes, can I just uh, interject as well, Chair? Um, with the uh, Under the Constitution, the notice of motion and any notice of motion will go to council or to the cabinet as um as a, as a right under the constitution yes. regardless of what so so the committee can't recommend that it doesn't go to full council um but um so um the the, the motion I, I think that andrew whitcomb uh, councillor whitcomb was um was 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 uh, outlining earlier was that this committee um reject the motion to review uh, the decision to switch off street lighting but uh, it will still go to committee or uh, to full council. Yeah. I beg your pardon on Tuesday under the constitution. That that because that yes, happens to uh, notices of motion, regardless of what happens at scrutiny. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank have, you, Mark. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I have a request from uh, the cabinet member John Ridgewell and also uh, Sean Morgan to speak. Who's going to start first? Um, Sean. I'm. Yeah, OK. Th th thank you very much, Chair. I mean, first of all, I would like to say something from a um, from a, a, a future generation's point of view uh, and the climate emergency. Uh, you will remember that at Council, when I brought a, uh, a, a notice of motion to declare a climate emergency within the borough, it was supported by 54 councillors for and one against. Um, and, and I think they, at that time that um, councillors understood that we as community leaders and decision makers, uh, we, we are the last generation to have a chance at reversing and managing climate change. I, I'm sure you will all have, uh, or many of you will have seen David Attenborough's re recent um, uh, documentary on the destruction of biodiversity. And this is our last chance. So, so I would just like to remind members of that. But I would also, secondly, I, I would like to I would like to thank uh, Mrs. Theresa Mott Norris for um, who spoke so eloquently at the beginning of this, and uh, she spoke about the the, the I mean the, the notice of motion is for a review, and uh, Miss Morris spoke um, quite widely on a, a consultation. Well, I would just like to say that the best consultation you can have is an actual live consultation or even a retrospective consultation and this is what we have in the borough now um, almost 70 percent of the lights are now switched to part-time night lighting so surely when we have received only two complaints which are considered um, uh, level one complaints uh, when we've switched off 70% 70, 70 of those, those lights in the borough, I think that tells you what the public's feeling actually is. Now, now Mr. John Scrivens, Councillor John Scrivens mentioned that nine out of 10 people, and, and I've heard many people, uh, you know, as a side quip, you know, oh, why the lights off or what have you. But actually, when it comes down to it, um, the, the, do people demand that the lights are switched back on? No, no, they absolutely don't. Because that, because we have a live, ongoing consultation now. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ridgewell. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Members. Um, yes, and thank you, Ms. Norris, uh, for your comments. I'd, I'd like to echo um, uh, what Councillor Sean Morgan has said. Um, I don't want to be challenging on this to anybody, and I think it's important to have a tone of understanding um and what i want to try and do in addition to everything that's been said is, is to put some reassurance into people's minds because um it is quite clear to me that um 
this concern is one that people have perceived of. And if you actually look at the evidence that exists everywhere across the country, there is absolutely no evidence at all that uh, part-time night lighting and switching off night lighting has increased crime anywhere of any noticeable amount. Um, and, I, and I would suggest that, that had that evidence be there, then, then, then I think those people, the signatories of, of, this, of this notice of motion would, would have raised that with us and, and said, look, the evidence is out there that in fact crime is in, increasing as a consequence of this. That evidence doesn't exist. Uh, and I think we should all um, gain some comfort from that. Um, Examples of this are places like um, Lincolnshire County Council, uh, the uh, Cambridge County Council uh, employed the Cambridge Research Group to look into this. Uh, Lincolnshire's police response was, had there been any increase in, in crime or accidents, then we would have asked the local authority to switch the lights back on. Um, national crime statistics show that, in fact, most crimes, when they are committed, certainly break-ins, occur between 10 a.m. and 4.30 during, during the day. In terms of academic research, and there's a lot of published academic research on this, um, some interesting work underdone, undertaken by the University College of London, the Department of Security and Crime. Dr. Lisa Thomas, Thomas's paper on this, extensive research looking at it, and again, no evidence of any increase in crime. So I, I want to leave everybody with that thought in mind. Um, uh, and, and perhaps just to finalise it, uh, if you look at the, the only Kafili statistics that I've been able to get hold, hold of so far, uh, and they relate to the lower Isloin Valley uh, area. And in fact, there are two years, uh, 2017 to 2019, two years where the lighting was as it used to be and, and one year where it wasn't. And the stats so far are that in 2017, there were 82 uh, recorded incidents of, of crime. In 2018, there were 92. In 2019, when all the lights have been switched off, it went down to 80. Um, and I think that, again, reinforces what we're actually saying here. There is a perceived problem, and I do understand that. We all have fear, perhaps, of, of anxiety of the, of the dark. But the reality is we are not any more unsafe as a consequence of this. Thank you, members. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. Mark, Jake, could I? Mark? Yes, Chair. Mark, yeah, so um, I've, the, I've counted that there's 14 members uh, present. We only had 11 vote last time. Is there any problems for any members, you know? And of that of that 11, one was uh, Councillor Collis, wasn't it? That's correct, Chair. Councillor Collis will have to declare yeah. verbally. There's 13, there's 13 members, as I understand, on the system. On on the attendance I've ticked off. Yes, that, that's correct, Chair. OK, so I just wondering if anyone's having a problem to get into the system. Not not that I've been aware of, Chair. Right. We've had we've had a motion now that we do not support the notice of motion in relation to the street lighting. We now will go to the vote. Mark, will you just again lead the members through? Y yes, thank you, Chair. So um, the motion from um, uh, Councillor um, Whitcomb, which was um, seconded by um, um, by Councillor Adrian Hussey, was that the committee reject this motion to review decision to switch off streetlights. Um, and um, if councillors now go to the show conversation column, um, which they can find on their control bars by, by clicking on show conversation, you will see there is a um, poll there. Item seven, notice of motion, street lights in, motion not to support. So just to remind members, to vote for is that the notice is not supported. This is the, the Councillor Etheridge notice of motion. So four is not um, supported. Against, if you, if you vote against, you're voting in favour of the notice of motion put forward by Councillor Etheridge. So just to remind members, if you're um, for the uh, motion put forward by Andrew Whitcomb, then um, then click uh, for. And if you're um, voting for the notice of motion put forward by Councillor Etheridge, vote against. And, uh, and then don't forget to click submit your vote. Thank you, members. Mark, can I get clarification on that? Because you mentioned uh, the notice of motion from Councillor Etheridge. 
I let, I wish to question that because that wasn't moved by him and it wasn't seconded. He had no right, to, no right to do that. It is the committee only that can make any um, decision. That's correct, Chair. But I, so I there's, met, there's no I question met, about whether you vote in for the notice of motion submitted by Councillor Etheridge. The only issue is the notice is the motion from Councillor Whitcomb. Correct. That is correct, I th Chair. I think you confused a bit then that there was two different aspects. Sorry for any confusion, Chair. That is correct what you said. Thank you very much because I got confused when you started saying it. I thought, well, uh, I can't remember Councillor Etheridge or Councillor uh, Dick's second in it. No, that, that, that's I mean? correct. It, it, it's, it's, it's the motion put forward by Councillor Thank Etheridge. you. Thank you. We all learn. Right. Does everyone understand now how to get into the vote? Is anyone concerned? Right. You're going to give us a time scale now then, Mark? Um, so at the moment we have um, five for and five against, no abstentions, ten responses received so far. Uh, Mark, you haven't had my vote yet. And of course, Collins. yes, if, if we could have uh, Councillor Collis's vote. Uh, sorry, Chair, that's over to you. Sorry, um, I, I, I prefer to vote against this motion of switching off street lights. So at the moment, so that's six for electronically, five against electronically, plus the verbal vote from Councillor Collis. So that is six all. Um, so six for and six against, with no abstentions. Well, that's the casting vote for me. I vote and I support the the motion by Councillor Whitcomb. Okay. And so so do I, uh, Trude. Well, have you voted, Tom? Well, I, I don't know what I press, but I, I want to, I'm supporting uh, Andy Whitcomb. Uh, well, anyway, the vote has been taken. It's, uh, right, it's the chairman's casting vote to support the motion from Councillor Whitcomb. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone, for that. Right, then we go on to the agenda then, which is the next item. Ah, makes you wonder. Item eight, which is the Kafiri Green Infrastructure Strategy, which is page 29 to 92. And we have uh, Mike Heddington and uh, Phil Griffiths. Mike. Chair, I think only Phil's going to be here tonight. Uh, I think I'm right in saying. All right then, Phil. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, I thought Councillor Ridgewell was going to. Um, um, you, are you? Going, well, I, I was told that it was the officer. John, I, are you going to? Are you going to? Yes, Chair. Uh, yeah, yes, Chair. My, my plan was to. My plan was to introduce the report. Yes. Right. I'm sorry because I was told that uh, it was the officer. Right. Uh, then, sorry no. about that. No problem. I'm quite happy if the officer wants to do it, but but it was going to be oh, my oh, You, you um, volunteered. Get on with it. Apologies. I, I, you may all know by now I have a small dog and uh, he has a voice. And if I speak, he seems to want to join in. So so we'll, we'll, we'll take it from there. So um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Uh, this evening we have before us the Kafili Green Infrastructure Strategy. So the pur purpose of this report is to seek the views of the Scrutiny Committee on the adoption of, of a Kafili Green Infrastructure Strategy, the Kafili GIS, prior to a presentation to Cabinet for approval. The draft strategy can be found in Appendix 1 and the report summarises its content and methodology. Um, from my perspective, I can't stress enough the importance of this document. Legislation is changing and with it a real shift in recognition of the significance, in my view, uh, of our green infrastructure. I think that uh, everyone would acknowledge how important access to our parks and open spaces has been this year, particularly, and the vital role it's played in helping people's physical and perhaps more importantly, their, their mental well-being during this terrible pandemic. So in, in summary, the report describes the need for a green infrastructure strategy for the county borough and details the methodology used to prepare the strategy. 
Uh, each step of the process is outlined and concludes with a template for the preparation of a five year integrated action plan. And, and that's really where the work is done. Importantly, however, um, uh, the, um, the strategy has not been developed. Uh, uh, the infrastructure strategy has not been developed uh, in isolation. Uh, and um, it's been designed to provide a great fit with other environmental strategies that we have, also that our neighbours have, and it acts as a template in a preparation for a five year integrated plan. So, um, uh, we, as such, we're being asked now to adopt the strategy uh, as the core green space development and management tool for Kofili County Borough Council. So, I can just move on, on to the recommendation um, that this scrutiny committee considers this report. And, append, and the appended uh, Kofili Green Infrastructure Strategy. Isn't that hard to say, actually? Yeah. Um, and provides any comments or suggested amendments prior to presentation to Cabinet for approval. Furthermore, to adopt this strategy as the core guidance document for green space development and management within the county borough. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Chair and members. Iron Office will be happy to take questions. Phil, do you want to make any further comment? You haven't left much for you to say anyway, though, so. <laughs> I think that's right. I think that's right, Chair. I'll leave you with what John said. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Any question? We got one question from Steve Kent. Steve. Councillor Kent. Yeah, sorry, I was clicking buttons. Um, right. Yeah, my question, I know this deals with more predominantly outdoor spaces, but it seems to be when we're filled, I can use a site example of um, a new building going on Time School Field. Um, where that's a green space at the moment, and our regeneration department and planning department have put through, and our, and our architects have put through plans for a new build, small building on this thing. Are they working to a strategy whereby we can use rainwater harvesting? Because this is just a straightforward building. Is this is this green strategy linked to other regeneration areas, or just solely outdoor spaces? Um, um, in, in terms of the toy development, I'm sorry, I can't really comment on that, but it, it, that's a sort of specific, yeah. specific on the site. It's, it's kind of standard practice now to, to, to do rainwater harvesting, and that, which is all part of the sort of wider blue-green infrastructure in flood management and, 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 and the, the reduction in the use of resources. Um, I think it was something in the region of 300 litres of water a day we, we, we each use. So you know, it's, a, it's a target to reduce to, to reduce that. But no, the strategy doesn't work in it isn't in isolation, and it can apply to urban areas, um, which in, in many respects, urban areas and urban fringe areas are very important because that's where, of course, the sort of biodiversity and 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 public space are perhaps most under threat, and you know where, where, where we need to make um, provision for wildlife to be able to get through the through these areas. But it. it it also works in conjunction with, uh, if, if you look at sort of bio, uh, so, um, green infrastructure and the environment as being an integral part of regeneration, it works across all strategies. So you'll see, with what, you'll see with in, term, in, in, in terms of the sort of um, topographics which are used in there, the, the, the themes, regeneration is part of that. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Anyone else have any questions? I have any more on the list here. If I could just come in, Chair, if, 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 and... and, uh, oh, and hang, on, uh, hang on, John. Sorry, yep. Anyone else got any questions at all or comments? OK, John. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Chair. I, I wanted to respond to uh, Councillor Kent's um, uh, a question as well and, I, and echo the, the thoughts, uh, the thoughts of, of Phil Griffiths. Um, absolutely, I think it is the answer to that. I, I think as an authority, um, we would be hoping and where we could requiring all new development to, to, to follow those sort of lines. Um, I'm not entirely sure this strategy actually uh, um, enables us to achieve that. But but as Phil has said, it's very much a blend and tied into that kind of ethos. Uh, and critically, this this is a, about how we're going to deal with the environment in, in, in the future. Uh, and, I, and I would certainly suggest that wherever we can, we use this document in order to encourage those people who we can't force to do it to do those sort of things, Steve. Thank you. OK, but no one else have uh, indicated they wish to ask any questions or comments. Mark, we can go to the to the vote and the recommendation. Excuse, excuse me, Chair. Yeah. I, I did put my hand up. Um, Sorry, who is that? It, it hasn't come up. Bob. 
Bob, it's, all right, Bob. Uh, yeah, Bob Owen, Councillor Owen. Yes, Councillor Owen. OK, thank you. Yeah, just to, um, with this, um, the, the biodiversity and everything, a lot of people are talking to me about um, sort of wildflowers on hedges and stuff and on roadways and all that. And there's a lot of it going on in, in various parts of the of the UK, basically. Um, does this um, take into account that is, you know, because it obviously is that the, we do the grass cutting, say, on our bypasses and whatever, that we can get the sort of wildflowers going there instead of cutting the grass back. Is is that part of uh, will will come under this this um, report policy over? I, I think Phil would like to answer that, I'm sure. Yeah. I'll answer it on two levels. At the strategic level, yes, what the strategy does, it identifies those roadside verges which are particularly important, be it for, you know, for, for connectivity, effectively. And, of course, you know, biodiversity and the like doesn't stop at our county boundary. It, it, you know, it, it, it goes across. We have sort of landscape scale type biodiversity issues as well as local ones. Um, and, 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 and the same applies for sort of flooding and the like and, and, and other things issued. So, Officers are in discussion with neighbouring authorities who are adopting similar sort of type strategies so we can get a sort of continuity going across the county boundary. Um, moving on to the sort of second part of my answer, that's the sort of detail of it on individual verges which, 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 which are managed and how they're managed. And you'll see in the report there's a section in there that you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be bringing a report um, later in the year, early next year, on how our roadside verges are managed, those which have managed prior, you know, with there may be a biodiversity priority and those where there may be more recreation and, and, and standard grass cutting on them. All right, Bob. All right, Bob. Yes, thank you. Right, thank you. Anyone else now before we go to the vote? Yes. My Thanks hand is up, Chair. The, re Tudor. the recommendation is 3-1. Tudor. Yes. Councillor Adams, my hand is up. Well, I can't see it on the on the on the side. I haven't got it. Oh, hang on. Okay, go ahead then, Mike. Here we are. Just to come back to Steve Kent on the Twine uh, School. Uh, at the recent pa uh, planning meeting, his colleague uh, Councillor Fussell certainly made uh, issue of uh, including uh, anything that we could do uh, for biodiversity, and that was taken on board in the in the uh, the conditions. So it's already started. In your borough, Steve. Okay, Mark. Thanks. You, Mark Williams. Have you? Do you wish to speak? I see your hand being up. Uh, so yeah. So, so sorry, Chair. I was I was just going to come in on the grass cutting, but I think Phil has, Phil has uh, eloquently dealt with it. Thank you. Okay. Right, Mark. Then we we'll go to the um, to the vote. As I said, recommendation three one. Someone move. <clears throat> I'll move that chair. Is that seconded? Okay. I'll second. Right. Thanks for Adams. Right. We now go to the vote then, Mark. Mark, Jake. Yes, thank you, Chair. So uh, if members go to the uh, show conversation section on their control bar, the um, poll will be there for them to vote. And it's item eight, Caffili Green Infrastructure Strategy 3.1 for, against, abstain, and then if you could please submit your vote afterwards. Thank you. Mark, will you take my vote, please? Councillor Collis. Yes, and, and we'll take Councillor Collis's uh, vote verbally on the phone. So, uh, Councillor Collis, are you going to vote for, against, or are you abstaining on this item, the Caffili Green Infrastructure Strategy, three, uh, which is recommendation 3.1? I vote for the Caffili Green Infrastructure Strategy. Thank you very much, Thank Councillor you. Collis. So that's 100 percent. All right. Yes, yeah, so that's eleven four chair, uh, zero against, and no abstentions. So that's that's carried. Thank you. So we thank go thank you for your support. We got the next item now, which is item nine: the public spaces protection order, dog control on sports pitches, which is pages ninety three to three hundred and thirty. And we have today um, on this one is uh, Mark Williams. 
and Gary Munford. Mark? I think, uh, think Councillor George is going to briefly introduce the chair. Oh, and then I, then, yes, then I, you've then agreed I, to that. Will. All right, Nigel. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, the purpose of the report is to seek scrutiny committee's views on the draft public face protection order attached at Appendix 3. To include the occlusion, exclusion of dogs from Mark sports pitches prior to the presenting of the outcome of a 10 week public consultation to Cabinet. In summary, public space protection orders were introduced in 2014 and can be used to regulate activities in particular public spaces to ensure that law, the law abiding majority can use and enjoy public space safety from antisocial behaviour. As such, these orders provide an opportunity to enhance the Council's enforcement ability in response to public opinion regarding dog fouling. The existing PSPO includes the following restrictions. Excluding dogs from all enclosed children's play areas and multi games. Requiring dogs to be kept on lead in enclosed memorial gardens. Requiring dog owners to read up, remove dog feces in public spaces. Requiring dog owners to carry an appropriate receptacle for dealing with the waste that their dog produces. And finally, require dog owners to put their dogs on leads when directed to do so by authorised officers or any on any public land where dogs, the dog is considered to be out of control or causing harm and nuisance. In addition, the decision to proceed with the above proposals, Cabinet also resolved in an earlier meeting held on the 18th of January 2017 that the proposal to exclude dogs from all council owned Mark sports playing pitches on a seasonal basis should be admitted at that stage of the process and be reviewed after a period of 12 months or once the impact of the above provision can be established. Originally, it was proposed that the ban of dogs on sports pitches should only be seasonal, allowing dog walkers to use the pitches off season. However, since come to light that the eggs and worms that cause infection in humans can last for years in the soil and therefore a seasonal ban would be ineffective. At the meeting on the 29th of October 2019, the Environmental and Scrutiny Committee considered a report on this matter and recommended the Cabinet that a formal public consultation exercise be undertaken regarding the proposal to amend the Public Space Protection Order 2017 to include the provision to exclude dogs from Mark sports playing pitches. The proposed exclusion are to be applied on a year round basis. The proposed amendment to the PSPO included a requirement for dogs to be kept on leads in areas near sports pitches. And finally, signage to be clearly displayed in relation to PSPOs around sports playing pitches. As the PSPO order 2017 was due to expire in October 2020, a six weeks consultation has been undertaken with a view to extending it by one year. This will enable ad ad adequate time for the full and proper consultation to be carried out on the proposal to amend the public space protection orders to include a provision to exclude dogs from marks, sports, play and pitches when it becomes possible. At, at its meeting on the 22nd of July 2020, Cabinet received the report presenting a view of the current position regarding dog fouling since the implementation of the original order, including the results of a formal consultation undertaken with sports clubs across the county borough, the results of which are detailed in the report below. With 88% of those who responded agreeing that dogs should be prohibited from Mark sports pitches, see Appendix 1. At the 22nd of July meeting, Cabinet resolved to undertake a 10 week public consultation exercise on the proposal to amend the PSPO 2017 to include the provision to exclude dogs from Mark sports playing pitches 
when it became possible to carry out a meaningful consultation with the public and relevant stakeholders. Therefore, it's re recommended that scrutiny committee are asked to provide any views on the draft public space protection order attached to appendix three to include the exclusion of dogs from mark sports pitches prior to the presentation of the outcome of a 10-week public consultation to cabinet thank you chair thank you very much mark Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, there was a there was a lot in there that Councillor George just uh, said. So I'll, I'll I'll try and make it very simple for the committee. So we have we have a, an existing public space protection order which was implemented in 2017, which expires in October this year. Um, in order to allow time for a meaningful consultation, we've done a brief consultation just to extend the existing PSPO by a year. So that is in place now. Um, the proposal before you tonight is to alter the existing PSPO to basically ban dogs from Mark sports pitches. And then a couple of other couple of other associated um, uh, additions as well, but essentially is to ban dogs from from Mark sports pitches. Now, obviously, the one thing the committee need to be mindful of: a meaningful consultation on this will typically take at least ten weeks. Um, we are in a difficult time to undertake consultation, obviously in the middle of a pandemic, so it probably isn't the right time to do it now, but at least by extending the existing PSPO by 12 months, it gives us time to do a meaningful consultation. So obviously as a committee, you um, considered this um, back uh, a few months ago and resolved to recommend to cabinet that you were happy that a consultation on removing, uh, sorry, banning dogs from, from Mark Sports pitches could go ahead. So cabinet agreed to do that consultation. This uh, scrutiny meeting tonight is the first part of that consultation. So what this report is seeking is your views on whether as a committee, as again, the first stage of our consultation, you would actually like to include in the PSPO, which will come into being a year from now, the exclusion of dogs from Mark Sports pitches. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Right. I've got uh, Councillor Whitcomb. Uh, yes, Chair. I, I, it's not a question. It's uh, I, I'm fully supportive of the of the. Uh, initiative to ban dogs uh, from, from public smart sports pitches and I, I'm totally in favour of the recommendation and I think it's about time. Thank you very much. Okay, Councillor Ellsbury. Yes, Chair, um, I agree. I'm totally in favour of it. Um, and as, as uh, Councillor Whitcomb said, it's about time. The only question I have, uh, unfortunately it wasn't at the, the previous meeting when this was discussed, and so I might be um, repeating a question. Um, we do have well we don't have that many wardens uh how are we going to enforce this if it comes in uh, because obviously i know we can't be everywhere at all times um but how are we going to enforce it how many sort of dog warden dog wardens do we have um yeah and I'll, I'll bring gary mumford in as well chair in a minute but um, so it's a it's a reasonable question, uh, Councillor Ellsbury. Obviously, we can never have enough wardens. You know, we we've we've got um, probably close on a hundred mark sports pitches, 60, 67 pavilions. We can never have enough. You, as you say, you can't be everywhere all the time. But I'll let Gary come in in terms of of his resources and how um, he would approach enforcing this. Hi, oh, thanks, Mark. Uh, hi, Chair. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, we have um, five enforcement officers at present. We're currently recruiting for another um, full time. And also the community safety wardens have the power to um, issue penalty notices for dog fouling. And I think there's five. And again, they're recruiting at present of them. So um, we are there. And what we try and do is obviously target certain areas if we get complaints about certain parks, um, etc. We will try and target, you know, um, routine inspections then or officers um, uh, walking around the areas at specific times um, when we get notified. So we do target resources, but we also carry out 
random checks as well to try and catch people and hopefully as the message gets through to everyone you know um and disseminates out you know that it it'll be be an offense to do uh have your dog on the sports pitch then hopefully it'll become less and less and there'll be less need for enforcement okay thanks thanks chair right councillor kent thank you chairman um yeah, it's following up from Colin's question. I, I was going to ask them um, about policing the issue. And while I remember talking to Mark when we had the meeting back in 2017, and there was a similar concern, but since this public space protection order has been in place with, uh, for the last three years, how many fixed penalty notices have been issued to people allowing their dogs to prowl in public parks? Again, I have to defer to Gary for that one, Chair. You moved it, Gary. Sorry, I will get the exact figure with you. I think it uh, just stayed up until the summer. There was um, 39 served for actual witnessing dog fouling and 59 for um, have been served on people because they haven't had the means to pick up dog waste when been stopped by officers so that means they haven't got a, a poo bag or whatever you want to call it to pick up yeah. which is um you know that's been more useful one of the problems with the actual dog fouling is you've got to be right place for right time so the original PSPO brought in um if you do not have the means to pick up with your dog when stopped by an officer that made that an offense and that's proved um more successful because we can just ask people that are walking their dogs instead of waiting to try and catch the dog in the act, so to speak. So, oh, thank you. It's brilliant. And thanks for having the figures to hand as well. <laughs> right, uh, Councillor Priest Denver. You've got your mic microphone off. Right, fine, right, fine. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to uh, support our, our feelings on this. All uh, council uh, sports grounds marked, all parks. We've got our, our highways now and, and, and side uh, walks covered. And I think what we are forgetting here, this is only brought in purely and simply because of the diseases that these animals, the feces of these animals carry. And what I would like before when this does go to uh, discussion again, Chair, is that, that we have an actual number, if possible, of the number of children that have lost their eyesight and any other things that they picked up purely and simply because of dog fouling. So I would support the council's attitude on this, ban all animals from our areas. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Denver. Bob, Bob Owen, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Exactly there, what Denver said about the um, you know children and that and anything that could happen there with the feces and whatever. I'd just like to ask a question uh, on you know dog owners around parks on leads and stuff would generally be if uh, we're talking somebody turns up as long as dogs are on leads, say to watch a football match. They're standing on the side. We're not going to be sort of saying, no, they, they can't be. I know we're talking on the field and this is right next door. That's that's common sense, I I assume. So if you turn up with your dog on a lead, you've got your bags um, and they're not actually on the field, that is acceptable. I just wanted to clarify that point. Yeah, it is. Is it? It's actually the Mark Sports Field Council. Right. So. Yes, yeah, so I, I'll give my example. I live, uh, my house parks on the show field in Blackwood. There are three Mark sports pitches on the show field, but that doesn't preclude a dog walker walking their dog on the other parts of the show field off those Mark pitches. Okay. All yeah. right, Bob. So I wanted a clarification. Thank you. Right. Uh, I also had uh, Adrian. Did you want to come in? Adrian, I see. Uh, no, Chair. Um... Right. What I was going to ask have been answered, but uh, Thank yeah, thanks anyway. Thank you. 
John Roberts, you'd indicated you want a question as well or a comment. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, I support it. We're on about Mark sports pitches. What about if we've got youth and other children who use regularly a piece of ground that is not marked, but is a piece of ground that they go there regularly? Are we able to do anything on that as well? And before I finish, I've got a I'd, we've got Appendix 1 as well, which is not Mark's sports. They're enclosed memorials and Appendix 3. If I got a, um, a request to make on those, can I make it now or do I just send in an email tomorrow? Thank you. Thank you. John? I, I, I think Councillor Roberts, it would be it would be useful to make them now so they're captured in the minutes. And, um, you know, because the scrutiny committee is part of the consultation. That's okay. Thank so, you. Then, if I if I well, may, so so, so I'm just um, in in terms of your question about Appendix One. So that's the existing PSPO. So things like um, memorial gardens are included in the existing PSPO. So there's 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 no um, no proposals to change that. Uh, Children's playgrounds are in the existing PSPO, which has been extended by again no proposals to change that. In terms of just open areas of ground, that's a little bit more difficult. Um, you know that that kids play on. So we would have to rely on the other powers, because you know there are other powers within the PSPO in terms of the duty to pick up dog fouling, the duty to carry a, a pool bag, etc. So we would rely on those things. I don't know thanks, whether Gary wants to add anything. Thanks, Mark. On Appendix oh, One, and Appendix One is enclosed memorial gardens. And when I looked at the list, I just noticed that whilst we've got the St Henry War Memorial down at High Street. The other memorial that we've got in the Abba Valley, which is a national mining memorial in, ha in Commercial Street, that's not on the list. And that can be enclosed as well. And it's, you know, it, it's a public area. Could we add that onto Appendix 1, please? Yeah, there's, there's no reason not to, yeah. And I'll Appendix like... 3, while well, we right. look at Appendix 3, page 281, we've got St. Henry's Rugby Club, two pitches marked in red, there's the middle, which is the cricket ground. Well, these days, that is used an awful lot by Abba Valley Football Club youth and St. Henneth Rugby youth. They do an awful lot of training and an awful lot. They're, used, they're allowed to use that these days, granted with permission from the cricket ground. But could we be mindful of that as well, please? Thank you very much, both. Yeah. John, I've been very good evening to you. Yes, Really, you know, we should be dealing with the report, but I'm in a good mood tonight, all right? Thank you very much, both. Thank you. Much appreciated, Chair. Anyone else got any comments or questions? That's the first time ever, Chair, I've known you be in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> Can I uh, have someone to move uh, recommendation 3-1? Someone move? Move that, Chair. Right, second, Hello, second. Chair. Second. Second. Right, Mark, let's go to the vote. Thank you, Chair. So if I could just uh, remind uh, members one more time to go to the show conversation section and click on that and the column will come up and the, uh, the poll has just been created and is there now. Item 9, PSPO, dog control on sports pitches, recommendation 3.1. And then if you could vote for, against or abstain and then click on submit to vote. And Councillor Collis, can I have your vote, please, verbally as you're on the phone? Yes, I vote for. I'm in favour. <clears throat> this is protection order. Thank you very much, Councillor Collis. Thank you. So all vote now? Yes. That, that's unanimous, Chair. So that's... 12 for 13 with um, Councillor Collis's verbal uh, vote, uh, zero against and zero abstentions. So that's 13 uh, votes for. Thank you, Chair. Right. Thank you, members and uh, officers and uh, Mrs. Uh, Norris as well. Thank you for that and being uh, very uh, generous with me tonight and taking it easy, you know. Anyway, wish you all the best, every one of you. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair.
Thank you, everyone.